Okay, on to the talk. Uh, Michael Karask is a programmer, writer, and trainer who has a passion for investigating and explaining software systems. He is the author of the Linux Programming Interface, a widely acclaimed book on Linux and Unix system programming. He has been actively involved in the Linux development community since 2000, operating mainly in the area of testing, design review, and documentation of kernel user space interfaces. Since 2004, he has maintained the Linux Man Pages project, which provides the primary documentation for Linux system calls and C library functions. Michael is a New Zealander living in Munich, Germany. It's interesting. Uh, from where he operates a training business at man7.org, uh, providing low-level programming, low-level Linux programming courses, primarily in Europe and occasionally in North America and further afield. Please welcome Michael Karask, giving us Linux user namespaces. Can you hear me okay? And in case there was any doubt, I wrote that text. <laughs> okay. Um, so, let me get to the start of the slides. Um, so the idea is to do the questions at the end, is it? Okay, then I normally am quite happy to take questions in the middle, but we can do the questions at the end too. Um, alrighty, so what I want to talk about is user namespaces. And, oh, uh, I don't need to be introduced, I've been introduced. I would normally spend a few hours or even a day talking about this topic. Um, about a year ago, I made the foolish mistake of saying I'd present this topic at a conference where I realized I had a 40-minute slot to talk about it. And as I got closer and closer to the conference, I had a rising sense of panic. I don't think I can do this in 40 minutes. I was right, but I can do it in 45 minutes. <laughs> and that was just enough. Um, so I'm going to leave some details out, but I hope you get the big picture. And I've got a bit more than 45 minutes today, I think. But I will be going moderately fast. OK, so before I start talking about namespaces, or user namespaces in particular, I need a bit of background. And one of the pieces of background I need to talk about is capabilities. Um, and so, oh, I don't know if there's any way we can fix those slide, the, the, the projection there of the slides where I'm losing the, the, the title bar. If necessary, I can fix it in software. <laughs> One moment. Uh, so yeah, I, I can do that. A little smaller, that's all. No? I'll carry on. OK. Um, all righty. So um, capabilities. Now, there's a traditional permissions model on Unix systems where you've got two classes of user. You've got normal users that are subject, subject to all sorts of constraints and checks, and you've got super user that bypasses all of these checks. And there's basically two levels of granularity. And if you want to let an unprivileged user do something privileged, the traditional way of doing this is to create a set UID root program. Okay, you create a set UID root. You make a program set UID root by turning, you make it owned by root, and you turn on the set UID bit. And then when a user executes that program, the process gets the powers of superuser, gets superuser UID. And that program can then do anything that superuser can do. That's the traditional way of doing things. It's a useful technique, but it's also a kind of dangerous technique. Um, this, this very rough granularity, I've got suddenly very loud. Is it still OK? OK. Or is it better? <laughs> OK. Um, this, this sort of coarse granularity is a problem. You know, we might have wanted to let a program do something special on the system, maybe something like changing the system time. And so we give that program the power of superuser. And the problem there is, suppose the problem is the program is compromised in some way, then it's got all the power of super user to do damage on the wider system. So we wanted to give the program just enough power to change the system time, as an example. But 
that program actually becomes powerful enough to do all the things that super user can do. And if the program's compromised, it's a very dangerous thing. So capabilities are an attempt to solve this problem. And the idea is, let's break the power of super user into small pieces. Now, those small pieces, at the moment there are 38 of those small pieces. This list has grown slowly over time. But there are these 38 different pieces that let you do some subset of the, the, of the power of root. So, for instance, there's a capability called cap DAC override, discretionary access control override. This lets you read and, uh, read and write any file on the system. There's another capability called capsys admin, which lets you do way too much, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then there's another capability called capsys time, and that's it. this lets you change the time on the system. And one of the things you can do now, instead of having a set UID root program, is you can have a program that has some capabilities attached. And now when the user, the unprivileged user, executes that program, instead of getting all the powers of root, they get just this capability, or maybe one or two capabilities. And those capabilities allow the program to do some necessary task. And the idea is that if the program should get compromised, it's a less dangerous program than a set UID root program. Yes, it's got the powers to do some of the things that root can do, but not all of the things that root can do. So it's a, it's a weaker thing than a set UID root program. Okay, so just then to summarize, we've got the idea that processes can have capabilities, some subset of the power of root, and those capabilities can be attached to executable files, and when a user executes one of those files, the process gets these capabilities, some subset of the power of root. Okay, so let's talk about namespaces a little bit, and then we'll move on to user namespaces. It's, it's kind of hard to describe what a user namespace is, or sorry, what a namespace is in a very succinct way. You'll often see a sentence something like this, that a namespace wraps some global resource in a, in a way to provide isolation of that resource. I'll try and unpack what that means as we go along. Linux currently supports seven different types of namespace. They've been added over a number of years. Um, this is the various namespaces, the order in which they were added to the kernel, the years, and the kernel versions. The, the very first namespace that was added was back in 2002, mount namespaces. What mount namespaces let you do is isolate the set of mount points that are seen by a process or a group of processes. And the idea is you might have a group of processes that are in one mount namespace. They see a certain set of mount points. In other words, they see a certain arrangement of the single directory hierarchy, a certain arrangement of the directories that you would normally see on your Unix system. But you might, on the same physical machine, have another mount namespace with some other processes in it that see a different set of mount points. They see a different arrangement of the file system. So what's being isolated by mount namespaces, the global resource is the table of mount points. Okay, there's a bunch of other names, a bunch of other namespaces. UTS namespaces, namespaces, what they isolate, it's really simple. They isolate two system identifiers, the host name and the so-called NIS domain name. And the idea is, for instance, you know, processes that are in one UTS namespace, they'd see a certain host name and Processes in another UTS namespace on the same physical machine would see a different host name. And you might have multiple UTS namespaces on the same physical system. There's a bunch of other namespaces as well, and I don't propose to try and go through all of them. But they're all isolating some kind of global resource so that the processes that are in a particular namespace instance see um, a particular version of those resources, and processes in another namespace instance see a different version of those resources, which they can modify independently of the other namespace instances. One of the really interesting namespaces that got added, uh, or I'll rephrase that, the, the, the implementation was completed 
roughly five years ago is user namespaces. And what user namespaces do is isolate the user ID and the group ID number space. What this roughly means is that processes, you can have processes that are inside a user namespace that have certain credentials, and outside the namespace, they have different credentials. Okay, and we'll see why this is useful soon. Okay, now we've got then the general idea that we've got certain types of namespace, seven different types of namespace, and for each one of those namespaces, there can be multiple instances of the namespace. And in each instance of a certain namespace, there's a group of processes living. They see a certain view of the resource, and in another instance of the same kind of namespace, there are other processes that see a different version of that resource. Um, when the system's first booted up, there's one namespace instance of each of the seven different types of namespace. This first namespace instance is called the initial namespace instance. Okay, so any particular process resides in exactly one namespace of each type. So each process on the system lives in one instance of each of the seven types of namespace. So a particular process will be in one user namespace, one UTS namespace, one mount namespace, and so on. For the processes that are inside a particular namespace, they see a certain view of some resource, like the set of mount points, and they don't see the mount points that are seen by processes in other mount namespaces, and vice versa. When a new pr child process is created on the system, that new child process created by the fork system call, it's in the same namespaces as its parent process, at least to begin with. After the fork call, then the parent and the child can move into different namespaces. There's a bunch of system calls and, and commands layered on top of those system calls that allow you to create new namespaces, allow you to move processes in from one namespace to another. We'll look at some of these commands soon. So just to make this a bit more concrete then, um, I'll take the example of UTS namespaces. UTS namespaces, um, it's, a, it's a nice example because they're quite simple. All they're doing is isolating two system identifiers, the, the, what's called the node name, or sometimes the host name, and the NIS domain name. These are the identifiers that are, uh, you can manipulate and view using commands like host name um, and domain name, and you can fetch these identifiers and see them using the uname command. And there are system calls that work on these identifiers as well. On any particular system, there might be multiple UTS namespace instances. Um, the processes in one instance see, for example, the same host name. If one of, one of the processes in a particular namespace instance changes the host name, that change will be seen by all of the other processes in the same namespace instance, but it won't affect any of the processes in the other namespace instances. Um, <coughs> So each namespace instance has its own host name that's private to the processes that are in that namespace instance. So we've got to set up something like this. Here we've got three different UTS namespace instances. The circles there are supposed to represent processes, and the processes in each particular namespace instance see a certain host name, and only those processes see that host name. And if one of the processes uh, in this box here changes the host name, It'll be visible to all the other processes that are in that namespace, but the change won't be visible to any of the processes that are over here in the other namespaces. <coughs> so there's a bunch of kernel interfaces for working with namespaces. There's some commands that we use with work, for working with namespaces. Now, one of the interfaces that the kernel provides for um, working with namespaces Inside the proc pid directory, okay, proc pid of course shows us information about a certain process with a certain PID. For each proc pid directory, there's a subdirectory called ns for namespace. And inside that subdirectory, there's a bunch of symlinks, one for each of the kinds of namespace. So this, there's um, seven symlinks in there corresponding to the seven different namespaces. 
one of the purposes of those symlinks is to tell us what namespace is a process in. And what you can do with these symlinks is you can read them with, uh, say, the read link command. And when you read when you read the symbolic link with the read link command, normally when you have a symbolic link, a symbolic link refers to a path name. But these symlinks are, are magic. They're created by the kernel. And the content of the symbolic link is not a path name. It's a string that tells us which namespace this process is in. So what we're seeing here is we do a read link of proc dollar dollar, okay, dollar dollar, the PID of the shell, um, NS UTS for the UTS namespace. This is telling us what UTS namespace this shell is in. And we see a, a magic string that looks like this. UTS means this is a, 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 a symbolic link for a UTS namespace. And there's a magic number here which is unique for this UTS namespace instance. OK. If you've got two processes and you do a read link on their proc pid NS UTS symlinks and you see the same number, then you know the two processes are in the same UTS namespace. If the num numbers are different, then you know they're in different UTS namespaces. There's some system calls. I don't want to try and go into the details, so I just mentioned them in passing. There's a system call clone, which is used to create a child process in new namespaces. There's another system call called unshare, which also creates new namespaces. But instead of creating a new child process, it moves the calling process into the new namespaces. And then there's another system call called setNS, which allows a process to move itself into an already existing namespace. Now, there are various shell commands that are built on top of these system calls. And we'll see some of these commands in a few minutes. There's some other um, system call APIs as well. In particular, there's some IOCTL operations you can use with namespaces. I'll briefly mention those later on. So there are some shell commands built on top of these um, system calls. There's a shell, a shell command unshare. What unshare does, it creates some new namespaces and allows you to execute a shell command in those namespaces. And then there's another command, nsenter, which is layered on top of the setNS system call. It lets you, lets you create a shell that is, or run a command that is executed in an already existing namespace. For each of these commands, there's options saying, what do you want to do? Which namespace do you want to create? Or which namespace do you want to move into? So for instance, when we use unshare, here I'm saying you can use the dash u option to say, create a new user namespace and run this command in that namespace. And there's options for all of the other type 7, all the other types of namespace as well. Again, with nsenter, you can say, I want to enter an existing namespace. And you can say, what kind of namespace do you want to move into? Is it a user namespace, or a UTS namespace, or a PID namespace? And then having moved into that namespace, you say you want to execute a command in that namespace. Now, of course, that namespace that already exists, there's some processes that are inside that namespace. And so in order to, to identify the namespace you want to move into, you say, I want to move into the UTS or the, the user namespace, the same user namespace as the process that has this PID. So you do both things. You say, which PID, well, which um, namespace do you want to move into? And it's the namespace associated with a certain pro existing process. OK. There's some rules about creating these namespace types. Uh, to create a new user namespace, you don't need to have any special privileges. But for all the other kinds of namespaces, you need to be privileged. More precisely, you need to have this particular capability called capsis admin. OK. So what I'm going to try and do then is just demonstrate what I've just talked about. And I'm going to do a demonstration using UTS namespaces. OK, so I've got two windows here. At the moment on my system, there is one UTS namespace, the initial UTS namespace. And in the UTS namespace, what we're isolating is the host name and the domain name. Now, on my machine here, oops, uh, uh, uname. <laughs> 
I've got a certain host name, Antero. What I'm going to do in, in fact, maybe I should have done this. I, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the same thing down here. Um, the bottom shell here, I'm going to leave in the initial user namespace. But what I'm going to do in the top window is create a second UTS namespace and change the host name. So I'll do, uh, uh, again, uname dash n down there. And up here, I'm going to say um, sudo unshare dash u to create a new UTS namespace. And I'm going to say, in that new UTS namespace, run a bash shell. And I, OK. Now, to begin with, the, um, sorry, the, the, the host name there, the new UTS namespace got a copy of the existing UTS namespace's host name. But what I can now do is say host name and change the host name to something else. And let's just verify that change. OK, I've changed the host name as seen by this shell. If I go down to the bottom window and say uname n, that shell is still in the initial UTS namespace, and it sees a different host name. OK, now let's go a little bit further. If I down here say read link slash proc slash dollar dollar slash ns slash UTS, OK, that magic symlink whose value gives me a unique number for this UTS namespace, then I see a certain number there. And if I do the same command up here, slash proc dollar dollar ns um, uh, UTS, I see a different number. This is further confirmation. These two processes are in different UTS namespaces. Okay? They're in different UTS namespaces, but for example, they're in the same network name the space still. If I do a read link of the net symlink, which tells me about network namespace measurement uh, membership, then I see a certain number there, and if I do the same thing down here, same number. These two processes are still in the same network namespace. They're seeing the same network resources. They're also both still in the same mount namespace. So they're seeing the same set of mount points. They're seeing, for all of the other kinds of namespace, the other six type, kinds of namespace, these two shells are in the same instances of those other kinds of namespace. OK. Uh, this is just running through. I've just demonstrated. I just want to make sure I've covered everything. Um, yeah, I have. OK, so let's talk. We, we've got to the point now we can talk a little bit about user namespaces. What user namespaces allow us to do is to have processes that are inside a user namespace that have certain sets of credentials inside the namespace, but outside the namespace, they have a different set of credentials. And so what we're doing is, is providing different UID and GID number spaces inside the namespace. And the interesting case is this one, where you've got a process that outside the namespace has a non-zero UID, perhaps 1,000. But inside the namespace, it's got UID 0. This process has super user powers inside the user namespace. Now, what I'm working towards is trying to unpack what does that mean to have super user powers inside the user namespace. OK. Now, these user namespaces, they have a hierarchical relationship. What I'm trying to say here is each user namespace has a parent user namespace, which has a parent user namespace, going all the way back to the initial user namespace on the system. To begin with, there's just one user namespace, but every time a new user namespace is created, there's a parental relationship established. And the, the idea there is that um, when a new, when a new uh, excuse me, when a new user namespace is created, the parent of that new user namespace is the user namespace of the process that created 
the new username space. That's how the relationship gets established. Now, the, the reason I mention this is because this parental relationship is important to determine the answer to some questions that we're going to look at later on. Okay, so we have this sort of relationship of user namespaces where each user namespace has a parent going all the way back to the initial user namespace on the system, um, which obviously doesn't have a parent. Okay. When a, when a new user namespace is created, the first process inside that namespace has a full set of capabilities. It has all the powers of super user, all 38 capabilities. Um, but it only has those powers inside the user namespace. So what does that actually mean to have super user powers inside the namespace? So what we've seen already, there's seven different types of namespace. Um, each one of those namespaces governs some kind of global resource. Okay, mount namespaces govern mount points. UTS namespaces govern host names. Um, network namespaces govern network resources, and there's others as well. What we're going to see is that for each one of these non-user namespaces, the other six kinds of namespaces, each instance of a non-user namespace is owned by some particular user namespace. And what it means to say that we have root privileges in a user namespace is that we have root privileges on all of the resources that are governed by the non-user namespaces that are owned by that user namespace. I'll have a picture a bit later on that makes that idea clearer. But the, we've got the idea that each user names, or each non-user namespace is owned by a user namespace. And if you've got a process that has all uh, has the powers of super user in a certain user namespace, that means it has powers to do operations on the resources that are governed by the non-super user namespaces that are owned by that user namespace. And only those resources. Okay. Now one of the things you have to do when you set up user namespaces is set up what are called UID and GID mappings. What, this, what these mappings do is say, we've got a certain set of credentials inside the namespace. What do those credentials map to outside the namespace? And the way you define these mappings is you write some records to uh, two files, proc pid uid map and proc pid gid map, and these define how the credentials inside the namespace map to credentials outside the namespace. There's a lot of rules and restrictions on what you can do in terms of writing to these files. This is for security reasons. Um, I'm not going to try and talk about all the rules. You can find out about the rules inside in the user namespaces man page. Um, but just to roughly explain how these files look, they look like this. There are a series of records where we have some ID inside the namespace maps to some ID outside the namespace, and then there's the length of the range. So you could say something like 0 maps to 1000 for length 10. And that will be saying 0 through to 9 inside the namespace map to 1000 to 1009 outside the namespace. A common scenario you see when user namespaces are set up is a mapping just like this. It's called the root mapping. It says 0 maps to some unprivileged ID, for instance UID 1000 outside the namespace, and the length of the mapping is 1. In other words, a single UID is being mapped. 0 is being mapped to 1000 outside the namespace. Okay. Now, um, we can use the unshare command to create a, a user namespace with the root mapping. So the way to do that, we say unshare dash u to create a, a, u, um, a user namespace, and dash r to say we want the root mapping, 0 to 1000 for 1. Or 0, not more precisely, 0 to the user's UID, 
Okay, 1000 is commonly your UID, depending how your system is set up, for length one. So here's an example of what I mean. Here I'm working as an unprivileged user, UID 1000, GID 1000, and then I say unshare-u-r, user namespace with root mappings, and I want to run a bash shell. This, this little bit of messing around here is just so my shell has a unique prompt. Okay, so I see UNS2 there um, as the shell prompt. And then inside that shell, which is in the new user namespace, I cat proc dollar dollar UID map, the UID map file, and I see the root mapping. Zero maps to 1000 for length one. Same thing for the GID map. That's also, there's a root GID map as well. Now, if in that shell, I then start examining the credentials and the capabilities, I see that the ID is zero, the UID is zero, the GID is zero, and when I look in the proc PID status file at the processor's credentials and capabilities, what I see here is um, all the UIDs are zero, all the GIDs are zero, and for the effective capabilities, I see the hexadecimal mask three and seven, uh, hang on, uh, three and um, how many Fs? Um, three, three and nine Fs, yes, that's right. So those nine Fs, that's nine times four one bits, that's 36 bits, and the three is two more bits, that's all 38 <coughs> capability bits turned on. Okay, that's a little hard to read. Um, let's just try that. Oh, I, I was going to show you something, but I, I'm, I'm, I fear that what I'm going to show you is actually not easier to read, but let's just try that. Oh, okay. Let's start again with some, some new shell. I say unshare-u-r bash, whoops, thank you. And then I... Um, grep for cap, oh, grep, hang on a second, I'll just check something, yeah, grep for cap effective in proc dollar dollar slash status, I've got a full set of capabilities there, that number's kind of hard to read, there is a command that you can use called um, pscap, where you can say, show the capabilities in the, of the process in human readable form. Uh, oh, uh, hang on. I don't have that package installed. <laughs> <laughs> I rebuilt the system a wee while ago. <laughs> okay, I'm, I won't waste time by trying to install the package right now. Um, but there is a command. <laughs> um, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Okay, um, fuck, hang on, sudo dnf install, maybe I will try and install it, oh, except I don't have network access here, do we have a public Wi-Fi here? Okay, I won't try it, I'll skip it, don't worry, oh, just trust me, pscap shows you the output in more human readable form. Uh, the, the capabilities in more human readable form. Now, um, oh, let's go back down he back here. Here's my sh shell, and if I look at my credentials, there are my credentials. I'm 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 root user root group. Let's look at my PID of that shell here, four six three three. Now, if from the outside world I say grep. Um, U G, oops, G I D. Oh, sorry, U G I D. In proc four six three three slash status. Now the shell here in the lower window is in the initial username space. So when I look from that side of things, the process looks like it has credentials 1,000. Okay, but inside the namespace, it looks like it has super. It looks like it's super user UID zero and GID zero. Okay, so uh, 
We might say, well, gee, I'm a super user. Can I do all the things that super user can do? Remember, the super user can do things like changing the host name normally on a system. So I might then turn around and say, host name, host name, Hukaki. It doesn't work. OK, what's gone wrong? These two, this process is in a different username space but it's still in the original UTS namespace. And this process doesn't have any capabilities in the initial UTS namespace. Okay, I'll show you why that is in just a moment. Okay, so what we've seen, when, a new pro when the initial process is created in the new user namespace, it gets a full set of capabilities. But those operations, those capabilities, that super user power is only for operations on objects that are governed by the new user namespace. Each non user namespace is owned by some user namespace. Now, the way that ownership relationship gets established is when a new non user namespace is created, at that moment, the process that created that new non user namespace its user namespace becomes the owner of the new non user name of the new non user namespace um, there are some apis uh, that you can use to discover these relationships uh, i've written some go programs for instance that you can use to discover these relationships i'll probably demonstrate one of them later on um, but the the, the the point is these these non user namespaces are owned by some user namespace. Um, and if a process tries to operate on some resources that are governed by a non-user namespace, what the kernel asks is who, which user namespace owns that non-user namespace? And then the kernel says, well, what capabilities does this process have in that user namespace? OK, and so suppose we run a command like this unshare dash u means create a new user namespace, dash lowercase u means create a new UT UTS namespace, and dash r meaning root mappings for the user namespace. Then we've got a situation like this. The, um, the, the, the bash process that we've created just here, that bash process, this is this process here. Now, this process is a member of a, a, a new user namespace, okay, that was the user namespace that we created here, and there's also been a new UTS namespace created as well. That's what we got by using the dash u here. And this UTS namespace here is owned by that user namespace. So this process here is a member of the initial username, oh, sorry, of this new user namespace here, and it's also a member of the um, uh, second UTS namespace here, but also, as well, there is also an initial user namespace on the system, an initial UTS namespace. There's also initial instances of all of the other kinds of namespace, like the network namespace, the mount namespace, um, the IPC namespace, and so on. And this process is a member of the initial network namespace still, for example. It's also a member of the initial IPC namespace, a member of the initial mount namespace, a member of the initial uh, C group namespace as well. But it is a member of a new UTS namespace. Now, suppose, um, suppose this process tries to change the host name. What the kernel says is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, want to, I should say one more thing. This new process here was created inside the new user namespace, and by definition, this is the way things work, this process gets a full set of capabilities. That's what this notation here means. This process has a full set of effective and permitted capabilities. Now, suppose this process um, was asked, or suppose this process tried to change the host name. What the kernel says is host names are governed by the UTS namespace, or by UTS namespaces. So then the kernel says, well, which UTS namespace does this process belong to? And the answer, of course, is it's in this UTS namespace. And then the kernel's next question is, which user namespace owns this non 
owns this UTS namespace? And the answer is this one. And then the kernel says, okay, what capabilities does this process have in that namespace, in that user namespace? And the answer is, well, this process is in that user namespace, and it has all the capabilities. So it's allowed to change the host name. On the other hand, suppose this process tried to bind a privileged network port. In other words, a port, a port, a socket port in the range 0 through to 1023. To do that, you need to have a certain capability. It's the capability called capnet bind service. Now, in that case, again, the kernel says, you know, this process wants to change a network-related resource. Those network-related resources are governed by network namespaces. So the kernel says, which network namespace is this process a member of? And the answer is this one. And then the kernel says, well, which user namespace owns this network namespace? And the answer is this one. And then the kernel says, what capabilities does this process have in that namespace. Well, this process has a full set of capabilities, but it doesn't have them in that namespace because it's not a member of that namespace. So this process isn't allowed to bind a privileged network port. OK. Seem OK? So, um, just to demonstrate that, perhaps with some um, uh, uh, some other examples. So here I'm now going to just do the equivalent of what I just showed you in the picture, creating a new user namespace with a root mapping and a new UTS namespace at the same time. And I um, so that that process there is in a new um, UTS namespace. Uh, and a new user namespace, and down here I've got a shell that is still in the initial user namespace and the initial UTS namespace. And here, as I showed already, I could now say, um, change the host name to um, something else, let's say Pukaki, and verify the change, and if I do a host name command down here, this process is still in the initial UTS namespace, it doesn't see the change because these processes are in different UTS namespaces. But if, for instance, um, oh, grep slash ssd2 in proc mounts. Okay, good, I've got that mount point. So I could say, you know, I'm super user in this namespace. Um, uh, and I've got all cap so I've got all capabilities. Maybe I can unmount that file system. And I try that. No, I can't. And that's because this process is still in the initial mount namespace, and the initial mount namespace is owned by the initial user namespace. And this process, this shell process in the top window here, doesn't have any capabilities in the initial user namespace. OK, let's take that a little bit further. This time, I'm going to say, create a new shell in a new user namespace with root mappings in a new UTS namespace. And the dash M says, and in a new mount namespace. Oh, and I need to be a bit careful here. Um, oh, no, I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be safe. Yes. OK. Now, there is a mount point here. Oh, when a new mount namespace is created, it gets a, the, 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 the mount points in the new mount namespace are a copy of the mount points of the process that created the new mount namespace. So this new mount namespace, now mount namespace has a copy of the mount points from the initial mount namespace. So now, um, first of all, just to verify something, there is a there is a mount point here uh, in um, proc mounts. It, there is an there is a mount point there called SSD two, and up here, grep. Um, 
slash SSD2, oops, in proc mounts. There is also a mount point there called SSD2. But this process is in a different mount namespace with a different set of mount points. And I can now turn around and say U mount slash SSD2. Uh, whoops. Don't you love it when live demos go wrong? Uh, what happened? Oops, uh, hang on. Hmm? Dash N? Um, I don't think that's the problem. Uh, U mount slash dev slash SDA five. Uh -huh. Rats. <laughs> Live demos wouldn't be so exciting if something didn't go wrong, would they? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Sorry? When you say different information, oh, okay. So if I say mount grep SSD2, SSD2, no, it's there. No, I, I can normally do this. I'm, I've just overlooked something. Okay. It is. You can see the mount is there. It's in in um, in, in proc mounts or pro, props. Uh, proc. Um, yeah, that's a that's a reasonable question. Is it really there? Let's look in proc self mounts. It really is there. Uh, <laughs> Of course, what's going to happen later on is I'm going to work out the, the, the simple thing that I've missed. Um, but, no, I don't need to remount proc. I no, I don't. So, in, I'm sorry. In, I, this is a, uh, a mount namespace question, but in a mount namespace, can you mount can you mount things in a mount namespace? Can you mount things in a mount namespace? Being, uh, you know, oh, being, yeah. No, hang on. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's what I'm overlooking. Normally, I do this with uh, I do this as super user. Yes, look, that's the thing I'm overlooking. You have to mount and unmount block file systems. You really do need to be super user. Okay, I'm not sure if this is going to quite work. Um, now let's try that again. Uh, U mount. Slash, I'm, uh, oops, uh, slash SSD2. Yeah, no, um, I need to, I, I've tried to create a, a user namespace at the same time, and I, this is the kind of demonstration I, I realize I understand now why it's not working. Um, I've created a new user namespace, and when I create a new user namespace, I can't mount and unmount block file systems. I can create other kinds of mounts, like bind mounts, but I can't mount and unmount block file systems for security reasons. Sorry, my demonstration failed. Okay. Hmm? Um, I think you can bind mount a tempfs. Yes. Um, mount dash t tempfs slash or source uh, uh, none slash dear or oh, slash MNT slash oh, um, X will do. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> okay, so t you can you can mount and unmount tempfs file systems, just not mount and unmount block file systems. So I've created a mount point here in the new mount namespace. Yes. So you can't mount 
file system that, or a, a file, a regular file that actually has a file system on it. You mean a loopback mount? Yes, a loopback um, I can't remember offhand. I think the answer is yes, but okay. falling flat on my face with one demonstration okay, okay. is enough. <laughs> But you can you can create mount and unmount um, bind mounts. You can do tempfs file systems. If you look in the, I think it's the user namespaces manual page. I did actually write the documentation. <laughs> um, you'll actually find rules about what you can mount and unmount. Um, um, I wrote the documentation, I don't necessarily remember it all. Um, so I did, I'll just carry on a little bit further with the demonstration. So I've created a, a mount point there in the new mount namespace, but that is visible just in that mount namespace. Now, the process down here is still in the initial mount namespace. And so if I try saying grep for slash mnt in proc mounts down here, the mount point is invisible. It, it doesn't exist. But if I say grep for mnt slash, um, uh, sorry, mnt slash proc slash mounts, then there is the mount point. Okay? <sighs> okay. This was the picture, by the way, that enabled me to do the presentation originally in 45 minutes. Once I got to that picture, I realized I could do it. Do it in 40 minutes, I thought. 45 minutes in practice. OK. Um, now, one of the things I mentioned earlier on is I said you need to, to create user namespaces. You don't need any capability. But to create all the other kinds of namespaces, you need to have caps as admin, which is one of the super user capabilities. So how, why was it that I was able to do this? Create a new UTS namespace just here. Well, this is treated as a special case. When you create a user namespace at the same time as another kind of user as another kind of namespace, the kernel says, okay, I'm gonna give that new child process all capabilities in the new user namespace, and at the same time the process is gonna have the capabilities to create the other kinds of namespaces as well. And those other kinds of namespaces are going to be owned by the new user namespace. Doing this is more or less equivalent to doing these two steps here, where we first create the new user namespace, and then from inside the new user namespace, then we create the UTS namespace. The difference here is this two processes being created along the way. Okay. <clears throat> so the seven different types of namespaces, they govern different types of resources. And the idea is that if you have a user namespace that owns some non-user namespaces, then super user in that user namespace can do privileged things with those resources that are governed by the non-user namespaces. But there's, there's um, some other kinds of features that, are, um, that a super user can do, some other kinds of things that super user can do, like super user can load kernel modules. And so you might look at the situation, here we are, Super user, all capabilities, can I load a kernel module? Or can I change the system time? You probably hope the answer is no. And the answer, that, that's correct. Because these other kinds of resources that aren't governed by any kind of namespace, when, the, when a process tries to do an operation on those kinds of resources, the kernel's question then becomes, what privileges does this process have in the initial user namespace? And, of course, this process here, it's in a new user namespace. It doesn't have any capabilities in the initial user namespace. Okay. Now, then you might say, well, hang on. Let's have some fun here. Uh, where am I? Okay, good. Let's, let's touch a file. Okay, I'm going to start again. <laughs> I'm going to create a new username, just a new username space. Oh, ah, that was my problem, the sudo command. I want to, let's try that again. I don't need to use sudo, I want to be really just doing this as an unprivileged user, create a user namespace, 
my ID is zero, touch Q, alias dash L of Q. Hmm. Files owned by root. Is it really? What do we think? What happens is that when we're inside a user namespace, all credentials that we see get mapped to how they would look inside that namespace. So if down here, I turn around and look at that file, okay, it's just owned by user ID 1000. Okay, if I just do that uh, as a numeric listing, there it is, UID 1000. But up here, if I say ls-li, looks like it's owned by, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Looks like it's owned by UID 0. Okay, so when it comes to access, accessing things like files, then the process's credentials, no matter which username space it is in, they are mapped back to whatever they would look like in the initial username space. So you, you don't get to create and manipulate files owned by true super user. Okay. Um, security issues. So there's a kernel developer, Eric Biederman, who spent more than five years of his life bringing user namespaces to fruition. And the reason he spent such a long time doing it is because we're now in the situation where we can take an unprivileged process and give it super user powers inside a user namespace. And, sorry. yeah. Uh, sorry, I just, what, what, uh, what version of the kernel do, is it considered mostly complete? Uh, the, the implementation of user namespaces was largely complete, complete by about kernel 3.8. There's okay. been a few more pieces polished since then, but the fundamental step, which was unprivileged user namespaces, was Linux 3.8. Okay. So in the five or nearly six years that preceded that, um, this kernel developer worked on you know, bringing this this work to completion. And the reason it took so long is people were terribly worried about security issues because we're giving a process super user powers inside the user namespace. But what if those powers could somehow leak out so that the process could actually do something privileged in the initial user namespace? That was the concern. You know, maybe there was some bug in the kernel code that was injected. It turns out, indeed, there were a few. Okay. There's been a series of bugs that have been found and fixed. Um, I haven't heard of so many of the bugs lately, so maybe we're getting to a point of stability now. But at the beginning, there were a few bugs found, and they essentially meant you know, an unprivileged user could do something that previously only true super user could do. OK, the problem was that the user namespace implementation touched so much kernel code that there were some corner cases that were overlooked. And the point about user namespaces is now unprivileged users can execute system calls and kernel code paths that might have had weaknesses in them, but formerly some of those system calls could only be executed by super user. But now they can be executed by unprivileged users. And if there's some, some sort of fault in the design of those system calls or some security issue, now that, that issue can be tested by unprivileged users. So these bugs have been found. They've been fixed over time. OK. Um, so the, 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 the great thing about user namespaces, they give unprivileged users access to a lot of functionality that was formerly only available to super user, but in a controlled way. Um, so what sort of things can we do? Well, nowadays we can have containers that are fired up by unprivileged users. So you can have unprivileged Docker instances, unprivileged LXC users. You can have Chrome-style sandboxing without the need for set UID um, root helpers, which is what was used for sandboxing things like the rendering process with Chrome in earlier times. One of the um, cute things that you can do with user namespaces, and this is a technique that's used by some of the browsers with rendering processes these days, 
they put the rendering process in a user namespace that has a UID map that looks like this. UID inside the namespace maps to exactly the same UID outside the namespace, range 1. There is only one possible user ID that can exist in this namespace. There's not even the concept of super user. You can't escalate privilege inside that user namespace because there's no concept of super user. Um, oh, who uses Debian? Yeah, heard of fake root? Yeah, if you're a Debian person, and oh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. If you're a Debian package man maintainer, Fakeroot is a, a library that you use when you're building packages. Some of the packages that you need to build as a package maintainer, they need to be installed as super user. And the way the Debian package manager works is it says, well, I'm going to build the package with the files being installed by the same UID as the person who builds the package. So the package maintainer wants to build a bunch of packet or build a package where the files are going to be owned by super user on the installed system. So one possibility is you could run the package manager as super user, but yeah, you know, running things as super user, it's always a bit dangerous. So instead, the package manager gets run with a preloaded library called fakeroot, libfakeroot, and libfakeroot has wrappers for the standard functions that retrieve a process's credentials. And when the process says something like, you know, get UID, tell me my UID, the wrapper function just says <coughs> zero. Okay. Now, the process isn't actually being run by super user, but when the, when the package manager asks the question, you know, what's my UID? The wrap function just says zero. Now, what's my GID? Get GID. Get GID, the wrapper function just says zero. And so the package manager says, okay, zero. I'll write that into the metadata of the package. So the package gets created with metadata that looks like the files should be installed by super user. Now, when the package, of course, gets installed, it gets installed by a privileged process and it gets installed owned by superuser. But when we're building the package, we want to avoid building it as superuser. So one way of doing this is using fake root, lib fake root. But another way nowadays is instead put the package manager into a user namespace where the credentials uh, of the unprivileged user inside the user namespace look like they're zero. So instead of doing um, LD preload magic, Instead, we can just do things simply with a user namespace. Um, what else have we got? So originally, people added, or the idea of user namespaces, I think, to begin with, was you know, unprivileged containers, unprivileged Docker containers, or unprivileged LFC containers. But all these different namespaces were added sort of as orthogonal pieces that could be plugged together in other interesting ways. And what people have been doing is plugging them together in other interesting ways. So there's a tool around called FireJail. Has anybody come across FireJail? No? It's not as well known as it probably should be. FireJail is a sort of generalized sandboxing tool. It makes use of namespaces. It makes use of C groups. Um, it makes use of a feature called SecComp. And you can say, I want to run a, a certain application in a, a kind of sandbox where what it can do is limited through the use of user namespaces, through the use of set comp, through the use of C groups. And that means if the application misbehaves somehow, the damage it can do on the wider system is limited. The, the beauty of um, FireJail, I mean, it's, a, it'll be, it's an interesting tool in that, in as much as I've already described, but what you can do with FireJail is define a prepackaged profile for an application. And the, the beauty of FireJail is it comes with a whole lot of standard prepackaged profiles. There's a package, there's a profile for Firefox, there's a profile for LibreOffice, there's a profile for a lot of common tools. So now if you feel a little bit unsafe about running your web browser, you can fire it up under FireJail control and if the browser misbehaves somehow, because of the sandboxing, potentially it should be able to do less damage if the browser is somehow compromised. Um, Flatpak. Flatpak, again, it's built using user namespaces and also these other tools like C groups and um, setcomp, and it makes use of capabilities. 
It's an implementation of an idea that was proposed by Leonard Pertering, who was here quite recently, I believe, um, who was the inventor of System D, of course. It's a new way of packaging applications. It solves a certain problem that, who uses Debian, by the way, again? Yeah, who uses Debian stable? Uh, less people. <laughs> you don't like that long release cycle, do you? Okay, the thing about Debian Stable is a new release of Debian Stable happens about every two or three years. Now, you might be, and this is not just a problem of Debian, it's a problem of every distribution. You might be running a certain distribution and there's some cool new software package that has appeared and you want to use it on your system, but your distribution isn't packaging that package yet. The problem is particularly acute with Debian Stable because the release cycle is so long, but every distribution has this problem to some degree, even if the release cycles are shorter. And so what do you do? Well, you could go to the upstream project, grab the sources, build from source, and install in your system. That's kind of, it's a hassle. You know, you've got to probably not install only the package you want to, or take the project you want to compile. You've probably got to install some dependencies as well that are needed by the, the project you want to build. And if you if you get this wrong, you probably mess up the package management on your system. It's, it's a hassle and it's a little bit risky. Flatpak, the idea is, oh, and I'll, I'll turn, the, turn the question around the other way. Suppose you're the maintainer of the cool new upstream project and you want people to use your, your cool new software, but you've got a problem the downstream distributions aren't packaging your software yet. So what do you do? One possibility is you can say to your users, your potential users, compile from source. Okay, and then your users have the problems I just talked about. Another possibility is you become a package maintainer. You create a, 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 a Fedora package and a Debian package and an Arch package. Oh, but hang on, we need to have a 32-bit Fedora package and a 64-bit Fedora package, and maybe we need a package for Fedora 27 and a different one for Fedora 23 and so on. This gets old really quickly, okay? It's a tiring thing to do. So Flatpak is the implementation of an idea where as the upstream project maintainer, you can you can install Flatpak on your system and you can create a flat pack for your application. Now what that means, oh, sorry, I rephrase that, a flat pack package. What that means is you create a package that includes not just your binaries that are produced by your project, but all the dependencies of those binaries, all the shared libraries that your application needs, including things like the graphical shared libraries. And then you can say to your potential users, if you want to use my, um, my, 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 my software, just install Flatpak on your system, download my Flatpak, and then run my program. And you might then say, well, hang on, Docker? Doesn't know what Docker does for me? Not quite. Because with Docker, you don't get seamless graphical in integration. With Flatpak, you do. Because all the graphical libraries get included as part of the package. And when that package is run up on the target system, you get a, a seamless GUI experience. It looks just like any other desktop application. And all of this is done using user namespaces plus some other features. Um, Okay, just in terms of, um, if you want to find out some more information about user namespaces then, I've written a, I have written wrote quite a long series of articles on namespaces on lwn.net a few years ago. The, the, the index of the articles is there. Um, I've written quite a number of manual pages nowadays on um, uh, namespaces and you can find various, um, uh, the, you can check those various manual pages. There's a really nice blog post written by a woman in California called um, Linux Containers in 500 Lines of Code. And uh, she says, you know, it used to be 500 lines, it's sort of crept up to 600 now. But it's a really nice man page, uh, sorry, um, blog, blog post or web page that shows you all the steps in code that are used to build a container. Now, building a container on Linux in code is super simple. It only takes a few hundred lines of code. What makes 
container framework's so big is all the orchestration that goes with it. But the steps of actually putting a process into a container are remarkably simple. And that's what this blog post shows. And it can be done in relatively few lines of code. It's a great web page to have a browse through sometime. Um, okay, I I'm sort of done. Thank you for your time. And of course, questions. I think the idea is if you've got a question, you should step up to the microphone, or I can repeat the question as long as I remember to do so. Okay. I didn't think I was going to be first, or I would have gone faster, sorry. Um, so, wow, lots of uh, interfaces here. I assume that like almost everything in the Linux kernel, um, you know, it's an optional feature you can build in your kernel, or you can take out of your kernel config, you can. if you're building an embedded system where you have minimal memory and things like that. Yeah. A lot of the stuff can be configured out when you're building a kernel. Yes. I think that was my only question. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's an ongoing project going on in kernel development called the Kernel Tinification Project to make more and more stuff configurable so you can configure it out. Um, and some features are already configurable out, like namespaces, but there's other stuff they're working on also making configurable out for th stuff like embedded, which doesn't need it. Oh, Follow-up question. <laughs> so as far as you know, does, does everything major ship with it then? All, all the major distributions? And, ship with and, you what, know, sorry? Uh, uh, namespaces enabled. Um, and what about mostly, WW, open They WRT? mostly do. Um, the exception, to some extent, is Debian. And um, that's because they're really security freaks at Debian. And they've watched that there's been a few um, security bugs with the user namespaces. And so unprovisioned user namespaces are turned off by default on Debian. You have to flick a switch to actually enable them on, on um, Debian stable. But most other distributions, the, the user namespace feature is available by default. That's kind of related to my question. It seems like one of the most common use cases for namespaces besides Docker is for like sandboxing and, yes, and people using it to try to isolate well. things that they think might be insecure. Given the track record and given how complex they are and how relatively new they are in, in on the kind of kernel time scale, um, do you do you think that's a a good use for namespaces? Do you think that uh, you know we should be as confident in using them for that for that use case as as we seem to be? Um. A software always has bugs, and the bugs get ironed out. You know, it's like, you know, if you if you never want to face security issues, you know, never change the software. You know, get get a piece of software that is is you know always works, has no bugs left, and don't worry about having any of the shiny new stuff. But if you want the shiny new stuff, and I do, then there's a certain certain price, a certain risk. But you know, eventually we iron the bugs out, and then we're in the brave new world, and we have the shiny stuff. Oh. <laughs> there, there is a difference between like not using namespaces for anything, and yeah. specifically using it for a thing where you think you are trying to protect yourself from some risk. And that, I'm, I'm basically asking if you think that using them for that, you know, particularly sensitive use case makes sense for for, for security use. Yeah, for like security sandboxing. You know, that, I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. There are some cases where you can use user namespaces to improve your security. Yeah. But there are some bugs, or there have been some bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, next. Yeah, so I have a kind of historical question. So it's just kind of an in, like UTS namespaces. Looks like they were pretty early on. Mount namespaces were the first, but UTS yeah. was right after that. Was there like a concrete use case? You know, just changing the host name seems kind of so useless. I but. think it's worthwhile then to just go back to the timeline. Um, yeah. So what you can see is this is an interesting timeline. Mount Nances bases were added in 2002, and that's because people had concrete use cases that had nothing to do with containers. Okay, things like having um, per user private 
file system mounts, where each different user logged in on a particular system and they saw a restricted view of the file system, and each view each user saw a different view of the file system. This has got nothing to do with containers, really. It was a, a use case that people had, where they wanted to have different users to see different views of the file system. Now, what you see then with the timelines here, I think you know, UTS namespaces, they got added in 2006. One reason that they got added early is it was super easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, but, but, but really, it was super easy. Um, and this, to some extent, the same thing with IPC namespaces. It wasn't too difficult to do. But you see, what was happening by this point was people were starting to have this realization containers. We could do something like this sort of isolation. And we want to isolate these various bits and pieces, and we're going to do it as separate pieces. But some of the pieces were easier to implement than others. So we got um, UTS and IPC namespaces reasonably early because they were relatively simple. Uh, PID namespaces took a bit more work, so it took a little longer. But all these ideas were crystallizing at the same time, but that some of them took longer to, to come to fruition. Network namespaces, okay, the, net, the development of network namespaces actually lasted for several years. The work was completed in 2009, but it was actually started several years beforehand. And then user namespaces, um, 2013, well, what that tells you is it really was hard work to develop that feature, and people were really scared about the security issues, and they were being really careful and slow about the development. So it took longer. But that work went on for six or seven years before. Okay, so th these things did, were roughly happening in parallel, but some of them crossed the finish line earlier. Huh? Hi, uh, I've heard of a new container type called Kata containers or Kadia containers. Is that called which? I think it's Kata or Kadia. Mm. Uh, is, is namespaces involved with that? I mean, is, I'm, this, I'm not this, sure. The I'm article sorry. I read was saying that the security is a little better than Docker. How do you spell it? I think it's K A T A or K A T I A something. Oh, like I think that. Yeah, I think I've heard of it, but I'm um, I'm not familiar with the details. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Just yeah. thought maybe but I imagine that namespaces are involved there somewhere. Is it virtual? Is it is it hypervisors plus? It's so it's hypervisors plus containers. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I'm I'm not familiar with the details there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not very familiar with the technology though. Yes. This may be a silly question, but I have a question about specifically UTS namespaces. If you're setting the host name and it's confined to the namespace, yeah. is that available to the external DNS? Or like, what is the usage of something that would be confined only to within that namespace? OK, so think containers. You've got a bunch of containers on your system, and they each have a different host name. And perhaps as part of the DHCP broadcast that happens when the container is fired up, it, that container broadcasts its host name in order to get a unique IP address from the DHCP server. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's one use case. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there a system called a check your privileges uh, in another namespace, or can only the kernel do that? There check isn't route? a system call, but if you look inside my I, I, I mentioned, uh, I've got a... Sorry if I missed the slide. <laughs> no, no, it's not a matter of missing the slide. It's just, if you go and look here, I've got a whole bunch of source code, including a program in there that answers the question for a particular process, does this process have capabilities in this namespace? There's no single system call to do it, but by doing some parsing of files on the system proc, PID, uh, proc PID namespace files and so on, you can work out the answer. Awesome, thank you. Okay, it's a program called NS underscore capable. Okay, but if you go and look in the, if you go back, get, grab the tarball and look inside the namespaces directory, you'll see a whole bunch of code there. Do you know if there are plans to add more namespace types to the kernel, or is it basically done at this point? There's no, I don't think, no, the story is, I'm sure the story is not finished. I mean, okay. C-group namespaces were added yeah. back in 2016. That comport, caught me completely blindsided. I didn't even know it was coming. It just happened one day. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be other kinds of namespaces. Periodically, people have talked about device namespaces. They've talked about 
time namespaces. So you can have you know time virtualized. So this will be interesting for hosting providers, where you can have different containers that saw different times because the hosting provider is providing containers services for you know customers around the world. So I'm sure there'll be more, but I'm sure I don't know which one will come next. Uh, along those lines, do you know if there are plans for new capabilities or? Are those new done? capabilities are added as people okay. perceive so they are required. So are the last one that was added was, I don't know, three or four years back. Okay. The, 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 there's a little issue with adding um, um, capabilities, which is we don't want to have an explosion of capabilities because that makes the systems administrator's life even more painful. Sure. On the other hand, you know, sometimes we have really new use cases which probably legitimately should be governed by um, a, a, a new capability. It's a judgment call, but usually we take the conservative approach, try and match the new use case to one of the existing capabilities that seems to best fit. Unfortunately, the answer to the question, which one best fits, Kernel capabilities of options. Sorry, kernel developers options said, "Oh, Capsus admin." Okay. Right. <laughs> and yeah. and about forty percent of all the checks inside the kernel say, saying, "Do we have a certain capability? Are does do we have Capsus admin?" Which is really sad. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, no, that wouldn't normally be the way it would happen that you the programs would have to drop that capability because normally programs we set up to only be installed with the capabilities they need. So if they wouldn't be aware of these new capabilities that um, are added to the system. That's the way it should be done at least. Okay, all righty. Is there a limit to the amount of namespaces that uh, could be created from like a child process? I, I'm sorry, just... I missed that start of that sentence. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the question is around whether a um, the initial namespace could continually create more child namespaces. Is so when you say the limit? initial namespace, do you mean so? First of all, namespaces don't create namespaces. Right. Processes create namespaces. Yeah. And so, I, and what kind of namespace are you talking about? The user namespace, for example. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's use so, that as an example. I mean, the, so the point then is, um, you, you can have a process that's in the use in the initial user namespace, and it might say create a child in a new user namespace. Right. Okay, and then that child might then say create a grandchild in a new user namespace. So you can have arbitrary complexity there. There is actually a, a kernel imposed limit that there's yeah, a depth of after. thirty-two yeah. namespace. Uh, that, a depth of thirty-two okay. for user namespaces. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there is no, oh, well actually, there, the, I was going to say there is no limit on the width, but actually there are some files that can be used to impose a limit on the total number of namespaces of each type. So you could use that to impose a kind of width. I understand uh, LXT uh, uses unprivileged containers by default, but why hasn't other container runtimes like uh, Docker or has it implemented that functionality by so default? I'm not very familiar with. So my standard joke about container frame or containers is um, it's too high level for me. I can tell you how to build them, but um, I don't use them all that much. And I thought Docker did have the capability by now to create unprivileged containers. But oh, yeah, I, it, it does. It does. Okay, I think it's just inertia that, that you know that some of these container frameworks only only brought this feature in later, uh, or, or that some perhaps still don't have it. Okay, I have another question. And what what is the I mean, what is the problem of using the user namespace with union file systems? Because uh, what is the problem? Did you yeah, say? Yeah, I, I I I mean, I I think. That was one of the implementations of using the the user namespace with uh, union file systems, and right. that's something recurrent that I've seen in the in the LXT mailing list yeah. uh, a while ago. So they recommended not to use it, uh, but I, I I'm not sure why. Oh. I, I think it's something because you can mount a black device or or something like that. Yeah, I, I can't speak with any authority on that topic. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sandra. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I was just wondering, um, when C groups was developed and one of the speakers talked about how it was kind of developed outside of the kernel and kind of brought into it. And just how are these projects, are there, is there somebody coordinating like this kind of, it seems like there's an ecosystem of C groups and SecComp and user namespace so that they don't overlap each other? Or yeah, there's just... kind of sad stories there really. So, <laughs> um, we, in Linux, we don't tend to do centralized design very well. <laughs> okay, so you're, perhaps aware that there is C groups version 1 and C groups version 2. Okay? Now the reason we have C groups version 1, oh, sorry, C groups version 2 is C groups version 1 turned into an almighty mess because there was no centralized design. And then C groups version 2 was an attempt to clean up that mess. And this time round there are people whose responsibility is to coordinate the designs. Okay, now for namespaces, it hasn't been formally done, but de facto there is one or two people, there are one or two people who really are coordinating the design. In particular, Eric Biederman, who's worked on the user namespace implementation, has been keeping a, an eye on the whole thing. He, he, he is Mr. Namespaces. <laughs> Um, and he, he often speaks up on this topic when he feels things are going in the wrong direction. Um, I hope we never lose him. <laughs> Can you say a few words on the life cycle of namespaces? You told us how to create them, but now what happens? Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting question. When a namespace gets created, how long does it live? So the default behavior is when a namespace gets created, it lives as long as there is at least one member process. But there are also ways of pinning namespaces into existence even when there are no member processes. Um, and let me just uh, let me just see okay. Just going to go and look at the freshest man pages in the world. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, yes. So if you look in the, uh, this is stuff I added relatively recently to the, um, the, 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 the section seven page called namespaces. And it lists the factors that might pin a namespace into existence even though there are no member processes. And I can't really try and explain too many of these um, factors because they need other background information that it would take me a while to explain. But so, for example, uh, some namespaces are hierarchical, like user namespaces. User namespaces can own child user namespaces. Now you might have a parent user namespace that itself has no member processes, but it's got some child names, child user namespaces that have member processes. Now those child user namespaces pin the parent user namespace into existence. And there are various other factors like that that um, might pin a particular user, a particular namespace into existence. If there's something else that's interesting there. Um, okay, for instance, it could be a PID namespace and there is a corresponding amount of the slash proc file system. Then even if there's no processes in the PID namespace, the fact that there's a mount point that corresponds for a proc file system pins that namespace into existence. That's a sort of partial answer to your question. Yeah. Can you NS enter one of these namespaces? Absolutely. Let's 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 let's. I, I should have done that demonstration really. Um, let's let's um, try that. So up here, I'm going to create a UTS namespace. And I'm going to change the host name in that UTS namespace. So what I'm going to do is say unshare dash u capital um, user namespace root mappings dash u for a new UTS namespace as well, and I'll run a bash shell. And um, oh, just just to demonstrate the point down here, u name dash n. There's the host name in the initial UTS namespace. In the new UTS namespace, the um, the host name is the same uh, initially because I've got a copy of the host name. But now I'm going to say host name Pukaki. And then 
host name to verify the change. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do down here, uh, or I should say, echo dollar dollar. Okay. I want to know the PID of that shell. And so down here, I'm then going to say sudo ns enter into the UTS namespace of the process that has the PID 5270 and run a bash shell. Host name. Okay. This shell is now in the same UTS namespace as the shell in the top window. It's seeing the same host name. What if there's a lingering namespace and you want to enter that namespace? What do you mean by a lingering namespace? You had just showed a moment ago a oh. conditions under which a namespace might linger with no processes. Right. Yes. So, oh, then how could you enter that namespace because you don't have a PID inside the namespace? That's a little more difficult. It is possible because there could be a, one of the other ways that a namespace might be pinned into existence is because there's a bind mount to the proc pid ns symlink file. And then you can use that bind mount instead of a target PID when you use the ns enter. So in some cases, at least it is possible. If there is no bind mount, then you don't, you, you can't do it. Uh, so two kind of related questions about the design and the user space interface. Are there any kind of warts with the user space interface that you don't like that we're stuck with? And well, there's some you... there's some unpleasantness that had to be added to fix one or two bugs. In particular, there's a um, a file that was added called procpid set groups. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, proc, yeah, procpid set groups. And this file exists to fix a security issue that was found early on with user namespaces because we didn't realize there was a certain use case that um, could allow uh, uh, unprivileged users to do things that s true super user could do. And so th this file is now added and in the, uh, as part of the process of sort of setting up user namespace, you need to update this file purely to get around the security issue. So this is a kind of wart. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's one or two of these things, but uh, it's really, this is really complicated. And getting this right, I think, yeah, given how complicated it was, um, Eric did a remarkably good job. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I guess I mean namespaces in general, not, not just about user namespaces. Um, 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 uh, I can't necessarily speak authoritatively about that. I, some people have said to me there are certain issues with network namespaces where things don't mesh quite seamlessly, but I don't know the details. Um, but a lot of the other namespaces, like um, UTS namespaces and IPC namespaces, they're so relatively simple that I, yeah, there's not that many warts, I would say. Uh, there are some warts with user namespaces, but nah, that's not too bad. And the other question, which I, I guess you may feel you've already covered, but it was uh, if we were starting from scratch, like do, how do you feel about the overall design? If we were starting from scratch, would you use some kind of different approach to doing this namespacing? I don't you know, think like, so. I think what's come out of the mix is actually remarkably good because what's some people sometimes say, you know, why are these user, why are these names, why are there seven different types of namespaces? Why are these seven separate pieces? Well. Doesn't that seem, isn't that overly complicated? Why don't we just have a container API? You know, um, but actually the fact that we've got these seven different orthogonal pieces means we can plug them together in different ways to create other sorts of stuff than containers. Things like Flatpak and Firejail. So yeah, it's a complicated way of doing things, but it's given us quite some interesting flexibility. So I wouldn't, I would think it's, it's actually been quite a good design approach. But, you know, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I'll just say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't have a perfect insight into all of this. But, you know, it seems to me that fundamentally it's been a reasonably good design approach. How long is, I mean, bugs are fixed all the time, but how long has it been since the last serious security bug was fixed with username I, I can't precisely tell you. I mean, was it, 
ballpark six months ago or was it sorry i can't tell you okay. i don't i just don't follow it closely enough okay. i just i do notice there is less noise around this these days which tells me there are fewer bugs but i don't follow it really closely i'm sorry okay is this something that's linux specific is any other of the commercial unixes and things like that um have no, features no. like this. Yes. Well, so Solaris had a feature called Zones. I suppose I should say Solaris has a feature called Zones. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the past tense yet. And Zones were somewhat like namespaces. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of other systems, I'm not aware of other commercial Unixes that have something like this. But my, you know, the the head there for those other systems is an even stronger head because they have sort of become even less relevant. Solaris is the only one that sort of maintains some little bit of relevance. Also, you were saying that by default Debian has certain capability turned off. No, it has the, the, the user namespace facility is turned off by default for unprivileged users. I okay. assume that's uh, something that we can tweak? Yes, it is. There's a, there's a proc file you can tweak to turn it back on, and but only the super user can turn it back on. Right, right. What's that file? I forget exactly the name. <laughs> okay. It's something like unprivileged can unprivileged user namespaces or something. If you just do a grep Google Debian, Debian unprivileged uh, user okay. namespaces, you'll find right. it pretty Thank quick. You. Okay. I must name? say, you've got endurance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to demonstrate one more thing, just because I'm. It's 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 the biggest Go program that I've written today. I'm a, I'm a little bit proud of it. <laughs> um, I've been programming in C for 30 years, and the blessed relief of reusing a language that gives you proper strings and, and maps. Oh. <laughs> OK, so look, what I'm going to do here is say um, unshare, uh, sorry, let's say echo dollar dollar. There's the PID of the shell. From here, I'm going to say unshare dash u, uh, sorry, dash u to create a user namespace, dash r, dash u to create a UTS namespace, run a bash shell. Whoops, <laughs> not a Nash shell, a bash shell. OK, so this is a child shell that is in a new um, user namespace and a new UTS namespace. It's still in the initial mount namespace and the initial network namespace and the initial um, IPC namespace and so on. And when I say I'm proud of this program, I'm not proud of the graphics. <laughs> it's very, it's very simplistic graphics. It's text graphics. But what I want to do then is just. Um, go into my namespaces directory and then sudo go run namespace. Oh, and up here I should say echo dollar dollar because I want to know the oh, echo dollar dollar because I want to know the PID of that shell as well. And then I'm going to say go run namespaces of and then a couple of PIDs 5159 and 53. Eight, nine. Now, 5159 is a, a shell in the initial username and space, in the initial UTS namespace, and so on. Whereas 5389 is in a child username space and a second UTS namespace. And then, oh, <laughs> uh, yes, dot go. <laughs> dot go. OK. Now, what this program is showing is, whoops, whoops, uh, what this program is showing is the namespace memberships of these two processes. And what we're seeing down here, this is the, um, the, the, the shell in the initial user namespace. It's also in the initial, and, and here we're seeing the other non user namespaces that are owned by this initial user namespace. The ownership is in indicated by in indentation. 
So this user namespace owns these non-user namespaces, and we can see that these two processes, they're both members, that, that's the two shells, they're both members of the initial C group namespace, the initial IPC namespace, the initial mount namespace, so on and so on and so on. But the first shell is a member of the initial UTS namespace, but the second shell is the member of another UTS namespace, and that UTS namespace is owned by a second user namespace. Okay, and that user namespace, again indicated by the indentation, is a child of the initial user namespace. So, because often you want to, or often, now I, often now I want to answer the question myself sometimes, you know, I want a visualization. How are these processes sitting inside namespaces? Because you can answer the question by going hunting through and looking at these PROCPIDS NS sim links, but that's horrible to do. This program does that for me and automates it all, okay? So you can get this visualization, and I find that quite useful. Yes? Ah, uh, okay, so every user namespace is, oh, sorry, every namespace is identified by a magic inode number. That, when you look at those PROCPID sim links, those numbers were magic inode numbers, and according to Mr. Namespaces, actually namespaces are identified not just by an inode number, but by a device ID. Now, for the file system that contains the namespace file system. Now, so far as I can see at the moment, there is only one namespace file system, but Eric is adamant that in the future there might be multiple namespace file systems. So a namespace is actually identified by the combination of the device ID of the file system, which is what the three is, and the inode number. So my program, because I listen to Eric, <laughs> shows both numbers. <laughs> Y yes. Uh, did you get that information by walking the prod file system? Or is there I do. That's how I've, this information is being generated by walking through all, this, all the proc PID NS sim links in the file system to build up a tree, and then I'm, I'm displaying selected parts of the tree. Yeah. It's a, I like to think it's a reasonably readable piece of code. Um, I, and it's in the tarball. So, the, in, it, so the, 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 the slides are on my website, and there's a tarball of a whole lot of code on my website. And inside the namespaces directory inside that tarball, there's that program and a few other interesting programs. But this is the program I like the most. <laughs> my best pro Go program to date. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. What are you? Oh, what, th this is just LaTeX Beamer. Yeah. Isn't that what you mean? Yeah, yeah it's just LaTeX Beamer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just LaTeX. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good slides are made <laughs> with a make file. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>